Hello. Welcome to Cabinet Conversations. My name is Paul Tatro, and I'm the director of Ford's Theater. If you're joining us for the first time, <clears throat> this is the third event of our new series exploring creativity, history, and leadership. Cabinet Conversations are scheduled on a bi-weekly basis and simulcast to audiences through digital platforms, including Facebook Live, YouTube, Twitter, and the Ford's Theater website. I'm pleased to introduce today's discussion. During the last several years, how we rem remember and memorialize the Civil War has been a topic in the United States, and we've seen renewed interest in these conversations in recent weeks. As the site of political violence and national memory, we at Ford's see our work as looking not only to the actions of the past, but also to how the past informs today's circumstances. Throughout the country and the world, people have raised questions about the purposes of memorials to leaders who supported or profited from slavery. Whether in Richmond, Bristol, England, Boston, or Birmingham, monuments and statues have become a flashpoint for the Black Lives Matter movement. Since 2015, Fords has held an annual summer institute set in stone memory, monuments, and myths that explores questions of remembrance and memorialization. Each year, we find that the spring has brought new and urgent crises that require attention and consideration. And this year, more than in any in recent memory, demands that and more. Today, we explore some of these questions with you. I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Hillary Green and Kevin Levin to today's cabinet conversation. Both Dr. Green and Mr. Levin have written extensively on how a wide range of Americans commemorate the Civil War and Reconstruction. They are currently co-editing a book sharing different perspectives on Civil War memorials. As you'll hear, they've also been active in recent debates. Dr. Green is an Associate Professor of History in the Department of Gender and Race Studies and serves as a co-program director of the African American Studies Program at the University of Alabama. Mr. Levin is an educator and historian with focus on the Civil War era, Civil War memory, and history education. He also serves as a resident scholar for a summer teacher institute set in stone. Now, let me give me great pleasure to turn the program over to Dr. Green and Mr. Levin. They'll take the conversation over. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Hi, Hillary. how are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. Excellent. So we've got a, um, I guess you could say, a, a pretty hot topic to talk about in a short period of time. Um, the topic of Civil War memory and specifically Confederate monuments and memorials, which is obviously in the news over the last few weeks. and. I thought we'd start with, um, just to sort of kick things off, the, the big picture. I mean, the two of us, obviously, we've spent a lot of time over the years thinking about this subject and writing about it. And certainly over the last two weeks, um, we've been thinking, I guess, 24-7 about it. We've probably been dreaming about it. And we just either we're aware of that or we're not, right? Yeah, we are. But I, <laughs> but I assume for most people, you know, they're coming at this fresh, right? They're um, they're watching the news, they're reading on social media, and and they're probably grappling with sort of what it is that's going on, right? How do we how do we begin to make sense of it, uh, sense of it all? So I, I thought we'd just sort of start again with with the big picture and then try to sort of focus in on some topics. Um, and so I'm wondering, you know, for that individual, that person who who is coming at this topic fresh, right, and again is trying to make sense of it. Where do we start in in terms of trying to, you know, come to terms with this Civil War landscape, monument landscape, specifically Confederate monument landscape? Like, where do we start in all of this? What do you think? Yeah, I think I always go back to the, I call it the monument craze in which these monuments come up. And I see ourselves in the monument removal craze in the moment. So start where it began. 
and when it went from the cemeteries and the Ladies Memorial Association, and no one really complained about that because African Americans, Native Americans, Northerners, Southerners, they are honoring the wartime dead. They are in cemeteries. And so no one was like, okay, these are here. But when they go into public spaces, and the timing of it with the rise of white supremacy, Jim Crow segregation, lynching, and especially when I look at the map that the SPLC um, did of when these monuments come up, and when you look at the Equal Justice Initiative lynching map, you get a direct overlay in most places of when these rise is at the height of removal of Black voices from politics. So I start with those monuments, what are the impetus of those monuments? Who are the women behind it? Because I think the United Dogs of the Confederacy has not has been disappearing from these conversations and talk about what those women did. Yeah. And yeah. not just the monuments, but the textbooks, the highways, all that. And then look at the dedication speeches, the yeah. individual ones. And I say start with there and then talk about the various phases. We'll start with the beginning. Yeah. So you've laid out a couple of things already that we can already that we can yeah. sort of explore further. But just to sort of um, review a little bit, so yeah, you know, we have these different um, periods of memorialization immediately after the war, uh, where those ladies' memorial associations, white women in the South, are placing them mainly in cemeteries. Right? They're not the early memorialization is for the most part in cemeteries to commemorate the dead. They're not intended as public statements, although they are in a way, right? Yeah. Um, and then, of course, by the time we come out of Reconstruction, um, at latter part of the 1870s, 1880s, that's when we see this shift to the public spaces. So public parks, um, uh, courthouse squares, mm -hmm. uh, intersections, et cetera. So that, and that seems to be the, the, the monument where we're having trouble with today, and, right? And they're usually 1890 yeah. to 1920. Yeah. It's yeah. that period. And then there's a spike around the civil rights movement. Yeah, <laughs> but well, that's it's, massive resistance, right? It's, it's the massive resistance. And then one of the things you also get through this whole period and what's leaving the debate is that African-Americans in the midst of all of this struggle and these things going up always rejected those monuments. Yeah. Yeah. And even when they didn't have a political say anymore, you see um, even in North Carolina, um, some of the county officials complaining, like, if another person vandalizes this thing in the 1890s, early 1900s, we will try to kill them, lynch them. And they're using that language because African Americans are like, nope, we're not accepting this. We're yeah. going to use rock throwing, spitting on it, singing John Brown's body, creative ways to show they resist. And then in their own communities that they are safe and can protect, they're putting out another Civil War memory saying, this isn't us. Do not walk in terror. Do not think you don't exist. But we have our own memory. Right now, it's not safe enough for us to talk about it openly because of the conditions where those monuments came up. Right. And the violence of lynching and that complicity that is bought with those monuments and that forced silencing is yeah. also there because a lot of people are like, well, why didn't anyone speak up? I'm like, there was not a climate where people could speak up. Right. So right and from so the <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So right from the beginning, one of the things that I think people need to understand mm -hmm. is that African Americans, for example, it's not as if these monuments are just recently becoming controversial. What you want people to understand is that from day one, they were controversial, that African Americans um, understood what the war was about. They had their own way of commemorating, whether it was Emancipation Day ceremonies, right? There are a few monuments, you know, that you can find throughout the South, not many at all, mm -hmm. right, uh, for the obvious reasons, but that these monuments, and I think this is the part that people have, uh, people struggle with, that these monuments reflect the political hierarchy of the Jim Crow era, that that mm -hmm. it's, it's white Southerners that have the, the, the sort of the ability uh, because they're controlling local government yeah. to decide how the past is remembered in public spaces. And in doing so, constitutes an argument for legalized segregation. If you can sort of erase the past of other people, right, from the public landscape, then you perhaps can justify 
uh, placing them as second class citizens. And are, then you right? can also the placement of them at courthouses. Yeah. So then you have the legal system, the criminal justice system, and there's a ratio of second class citizenship, but also convict leasing, put mass policing of space and body control, whether it's through the courts or through informal means. So it's a different type of policing, which is why I think it's interesting now that the ones at courthouses have been a part of that removal. And when you look at the North Carolina ones, like Pitt County, Tyrell County, and even in Alabama um, and different things, they're at courthouses. Yeah. And they're like, okay, we're moving them. Because the, the, the even the protesters today see that long-term legacy of when they were placed in that legacy of various types of policing with yeah. the present day discussion over policing. And those monuments reinforce who is considered a citizen, a full citizen, yeah. And who isn't? I and mean, is there? You brought. You just brought up, um, you know, a couple examples. Yeah. But I'm wondering. I mean, is there an example of a statue or monument that 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 stands out that sort of really drives home the complexity of of all of this? The intersection of of the politics of race, white supremacy, the work of the UDC. Yeah. I mean, is there for you? Is there is there a, a monument that sort of speaks to that? Yeah, there are two. Okay. One is Silent Sam at the University of North Carolina. Why did I know Chapel you were going to bring that up, right? I'm a Tar Heel. In fact, I got my Tar Heel <laughs> pin on right over here. So, um, as a student, um, and as a graduate student, I purposely changed the way I walked on that campus so I would not have to see that structure and to see that monument. And because I'm like, no, I am in this present. I have a right to be here. I'm getting my PhD. So subconsciously or consciously, in my case, it was consciously, I refused to walk by it. So my whole geography was defined around that. And so when I graduated and my friend Adam Dombey um, found the speech, um, rediscovered the speech, it's been found before in the 70s and other people have found it before. I was starting to teach at an early at the HBCU in North Carolina, and I started teaching from day one. So I've been teaching that speech since 2010. This and is the Julian Carr speech. Julian Carr yeah. speech, and that line of a horse whip Negro wench as a yeah. black woman who got her PhD from Chapel Hill. And I'm like, I'm not her. Carr does not define me who I am. And so for me, that visceral reaction as a student, and then the ability to teach and educate and get my students who understand where Chapel Hill is and work through that process of race. What does this mean? Develop empathy, because a lot of my, some of my students had no idea that black students went out of the way and African Americans go out of the way to not have to see on yeah. our daily trails. And then the other is that the University of Alabama, our boulder <laughs> that was just recently removed. I have to, yeah. Whenever I talk about the United Daughters of the Confederacy, I teach a chapter from Karen Cox's Dixie Daughters. And then my whole class goes out to our academic quad and we talked about it. But that quad is interesting because where it was situated, that quad is a legacy of slavery. African-Americans hand cut as enslaved laborers that quad. The rest of the campus grew up around it. When Arthurine yeah. Lucy was here and a mob kicked her off campus, the Klan claimed that as a rallying point for the mob violence of 56. And now you have this current day and people tailgate there, have no idea it's there. And then Charleston happened. Yeah. Charlottesville happened. Yeah. So for me to be able to use that monument as a teaching tool to get my students to have conversations about our current campus, but these other debates. So for me, it went from student to faculty to teaching. And right now I am always teaching to have those conversations. because Most people don't know they exist, yep. haven't engaged, and they lack the language and the tools to have these conversations. So I'm providing that with them. You're absolutely right. And I think, you know, I'm glad you brought this up because the work you're doing on the campus of, of University of Alabama is certainly a reminder that the reach of the UDC extended way beyond just courthouse squares and, and parks. It extended to the universities themselves. And it does speak to the, to the UDC's commitment. I mean, we focus on their monument work, but of course, they're actually much more concerned about controlling textbooks, right? Really controlling that younger generation that never lived through the war and getting them primed to sort of take yeah. this message forward into the 20th century. But but I guess I want to sort of, in a way, push back on you uh, with something that you might hear from uh, maybe someone watching, which is, hold on, you had this teaching tool on your campus that you were using to teach your students, giving them the language, doing all the things 
that you just mentioned, and now it's gone. And so I'm wondering, why can't someone sort of push back more generally and say, hey, those monuments on Monument Avenue in Richmond, those are, I mean, you can't think of a better teaching tool. So what do we need to understand in terms of that distinction between history and memory that many people, uh, I would argue, are, are somewhat confused by? Yeah. Why, why did we still need, perhaps, in your view, uh, to remove that boulder and perhaps other, other monuments? The question I always say is those monuments did represent power dynamics and oppression. And the first question we always should ask, does it cause harm? Whose memory? Is it all memory? Is it limited? And from the beginning, that those monuments purposely erased a whole bunch of people's memories, including the African-American memory. And what's interesting with my current book project and the other ones, women, white and black, saw the next generation as the living monuments. Right now, we're only dealing with the lost cause version of the living monuments. And those black uh, women are doing the same thing and pushing. So for me, one of the things that the monument, even though it's erased, is not there. We still have the records. But right now, being on a campus, that African-American memory, that pain, that trauma, that intensity of that still exists. So that removal, that helps us get to some healing that I don't think could be happening if there. But one thing is, like on my campus and other campus, they're going into museums. They could be contextualized, they can have that space, but it's not in a public one that's an assault. But that so couldn't happen apparently at, at Chapel Hill. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of people, I mean, that was the original plan for the university to place it in some kind of museum. Yeah. And I remember even writing and sort of in support of it on, on yeah. social media. And I got a lot of pushback and I, you know, it took me a while to sort of come to terms with that. I, I sort of finally understood what people were getting at, but uh, it does give you a sense of just how emotional this is. Yeah. Um, and there's also no one size fit all model. Yeah. It's each individual yeah. community that has to do that. And so on my campus, we didn't have violence with yeah. our monument removal. It was a petition. And yeah. when you look at the petition um, writers, a lot of them I had in the class as graduate students and undergrads. So it's like, oh, wait, they're actually putting into practice where it is. And then also, too, the literature that you did with um, Searching for Black Confederates, Karen Cox, all these great new books that have complicated this narrative. Yeah. And then also to this, uh, the events where these crazes started. So I call this the monument removal craze. It's Charleston. And yes, it was the five year anniversary of that. Charlottesville. And now this it's flashpoints of violence, but it's the murder of nine individuals and mother Emanuel during Bible study is what kicked off this craze. So for some people who are coming new to this, this recent phase of protests is the recent manifestation of a longer history. But this recent one, that doesn't date to 2020, it goes back to 2015. So if they want to look at, I would say, start with that, and then Mitch Landrall's book, others that have come out, and all um, um, Blaine and Ethan, uh, Blaine Roberts and Ethan yeah. Keitel's book. Yeah. There's Denmark some great Casey books, Garden. Yeah. Denmark Casey Garden. And I think now that can get you a pulse of the current manifestation. And then you go to Karen, um, Karen Janney's book on the LMA's Dixie Daughters, uh, Remember the Civil War, David Blight's Race of Reunion, which is the Bible. I saw yeah. think um, of a lot of these yeah. things. And then your book, Adam Dobby's book, you can then get the longer history, but you can get a crash course in simple, non-academic ease, yeah. unaccessible language. Yeah. And I think it changes the profession, too, that we are more public person we see ourselves in larger communities and how to help those uh, discussions. But yeah, yeah. It, certainly, it certainly speaks to, I mean, this is a question that I've struggled with and that is, you know, what exactly is our role as historians in all of this? I mean, we write these books and articles and we, and we give talks and then we end up watching all of this sort of going on and it's happening so fast. It's dizzying. Every morning I wake up and I add to this list of monument removals that I'm trying to you know, keep up with. And it's just, it's impossible. Um, and I, I guess it's sort of, you know, yeah. I mean, I, I sort of wonder what, what is, like, what are we doing? Like, you know, we're talking here and we're throwing out some things for people to read and to sort of educate themselves, think more broadly, but, um, is that the extent of it? What What is our place in a discussion that often seems more about the present acted through these monuments to the past, right? 
Uh, yeah. Certainly, it's about a legacy of systemic, you know, uh, racism, deep-seated inequities that go back. Uh, but it seems, you know, it doesn't always seem to be exactly focused on monuments per se, but we're acting through them, right? Yeah, I think they give us the conversation because one of the things that this recent manifestation has really uh, talked about in my own work on campus history and, and highlighting the African enslaved people's community and understanding is that we haven't had the soul searching of that long-term legacy and we're afraid to talk about race. We're afraid to talk about and even wanting to listen to other sides. So one of the things I've been doing a lot in on the community is not just education, but starting those conversations and yeah. like saying this is a space for us to talk and also to a space for people to share. And I've been in enough conversations from 2010 and when I was in Elizabeth City, um, North Carolina and Pasquate County was trying to remove a uh, group of African Americans were trying to move their marker. Mm -hmm. And I saw that some meetings with the county commissioners and black community gets up there like we're willing to compromise. We just want a civil war plaza. Can you bring in the conscientious objectors? Can you bring in this? And they're told to get over it. And then the shouting and yelling begins. Yeah. Now people are like, oh, wait. I see your point. Let's listen. And that pain, and especially for African Americans who witnessed their monuments to the Civil War in buildings and churches and schools, bulldoze for urban renewal. And that pain is real. <laughs> and when you have an older person of color talking about that, and when someone says, Well, you don't care, they're like, You never set foot and defended us when we were trying to save our community. Yeah. And having that for like a half hour and the people like, oh, wait, we really did it. It changes how we can move conversations in yeah. there. Yeah. Oh, so, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say um, for me or Kevin, I think you, Kevin, because you have a good one here. Uh, you wrote about the Emancipation Statue in Boston, hometown. So we're in the front lines right now. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> what are your thoughts about the one in D.C. and um, and even the Boston one? Yeah, I mean, it's it's complicated because, you know, there are so many ways you can approach uh, that emancipation statue in D.C. And I love bringing, you know, I, I, I accompany teachers every, you know, the last few years through Fords. And it's always a, just a, a great moment because we're reading Frederick Douglass's address. So the, the so obviously, you know, he gave the dedication address in 1876. And as you know, it, and I encourage you can find it online if you're watching. It's it's an incredible address because it's so complicated and Douglas is never willing to let Lincoln off the hook as the great emancipator, right? I mean, he's he he you know he he basically says you know he was the white man's president, right? So it's a great opportunity to get at the complexity of of Lincoln's legacy, at least in the eyes of Douglas, just a few years after the war. But obviously, the 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 memorial itself is complex because it was paid by um, you know newly or freedmen, right? Um, and the enslaved man himself is basically based on a real person, Archer Alexander. Um, but obviously it's the position yeah. between the two, right? This sort of submissive pose um, that even troubled Douglas at the time, right? He comments on it, uh, not in the speech directly, but he did comment apparently at that time, Lincoln hovering over the great emancipator sort of beckoning him to rise. Uh, the sculptor was a local man here in Boston, lived across the river in Charlestown, and a a copy was brought here to the city of Boston in 1879. So that wasn't paid for by you know um, by freedmen, um, and it's sat in Park Square you know since then. Most people never see it, um, but of course now that everything is in the news, there there is a young African American man in Dorchester, local. Uh, who posted a video on his Facebook page. And, you know, he, he, it was a very well thought out uh, argument calling for its removal. And, you know, the one of the things I tried to point out, and I think this also gets at, you know, the, the sort of one way to understand monuments, it's not just alone or in isolation, but we also should see them in relationship with other monuments, yeah. memorials, um, around them in the near vicinity. And the problem with Boston is that other than the Shaw Memorial, which is of course, you know, the 54th Massachusetts, men in arms in uniform, an important memorial, a beautiful memorial, the only other statues to abolitionists in Boston are to white men, right? 
And Boston was a center of black abolitionist activity. And so it speaks to the power of these, of these memorials, these monuments um, to not just simply to erase that history, but to distort it, right? Because it leaves you with uh, an uneven understanding of what took place. And visitors, I think, between the Freedom Trail and the Revolution, yeah. focusing on the Revolution and those statues, think of freedom in Boston as something that white people achieved, right? Exactly. And that, of course, is yeah. that's problematic, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the other thing about the DC monument is that the whole neighborhood has changed. That's so right. I always found its juxtaposition with the Mary McLeod Bethune yep. one at the other yep. end. I'm like, oh, but every time I go there now, children are playing on it. I'm like, okay, this is not how I would imagine yeah. this monument. Yeah, yeah. And I think they even uh, moved the Lincoln statue to face the Bethune yeah. uh, at, at some point. But it is problematic. But, you know, what do you do with that? Of course. That raises, of course, another question or another problem. And, and my own view, of course, has always been that this is really up to local mm -hmm. communities. They're the ones who put them up originally. And they're the they, ones who got to put up the new ones to fix yeah. it. And that's the thing. It's added yeah. new is, is the one where it is. But what do you do with the, the continued one? Oh, I think we have a question about monuments on battlefields. Ah. All right. Yeah. So as someone who um, I will just give a disclosure, my mother's family is from Franklin County, Pennsylvania. So they are historically free people of color from the 1820s on up. And in my next book, I open with Gettysburg and the stolen ones. So I spent a lot of time at Antietam and Gettysburg. Those monuments don't bother me. It's a battlefield. I'm expected yeah. to see monuments. So one of the things in this debate I've heard a lot, I'm not sure, um, Kevin, if you have as well, is are battlefield monuments okay? <laughs> or yeah. in like in what's the distinction? And and that's I, I've I've come across this question a lot. And for me, it's appropriately contextualized at the space of a battlefield, and I'm expecting them. Yeah, you know, it's interesting to hear you say that because I, you know, maybe I see it as more problematic. Although I think the one thing we do have to acknowledge is that we're talking about federal land versus exactly like local um, property. And, and and that, of course, is, is a whole other mm -hmm. ballgame because trying to get the federal government to do anything, right? I mean, <laughs> so the monuments are staying. I think yeah. we can at least agree on that for the foreseeable future. And I think in most places, especially those run by the National Park Service, they do a phenomenal job yeah. of interpreting them, trying to sort of place them in the context of the battlefield. But, you know, when you're standing at the North Carolina Monument on the Gettysburg Battlefield mm -hmm. and, you know, that monument is a beautiful monument of, of North Carolinians facing forward on July 3rd, 1863. There's a plaque, very Lost Cause-esque, yeah. that praises these men. And what are they looking at directly? What are they marching toward? The Bryan Farm, a exactly. free black farm, mm -hmm. a family that had to flee, right, as Lee's army is coming into Pennsylvania in the summer of 63 and kidnapping upwards of 200 free blacks, right? Yeah. So, you know, it's, I mean, if you know this story, if you know this history, you can certainly use these monuments as windows into this past. But, you know, for the average family, I wonder what they are walking yeah. away from, you know, seeing Robert E. Lee hovering yeah. over, you know, looking out over Cemetery Ridge. Does this reinforce the lost cause of well, a see. gallant, attack right See, the high the, watermark the only time i think gettysburg's i go there is when they do bike week but other than that because they have both sides there um and the alabama monument i teach that one i'm like yeah it took yeah. years and i always put a picture that i took at the battlefield of it but yeah. the thing about the north carolina as someone who knows about and has grown up here and about the stolen ones that african americans taken there's a conversation that I think happens locally that doesn't always happen nationally. And they're yeah. like, oh, yeah. they're going here and it allows them to talk about Brian's farm. Yeah. But the Federal Park Service and the National Parks of Gettysburg and Antietam have done such a great job okay. that in these spaces, I'm fine with some of the yeah. state ones, though. Like in North Carolina, they could do some better contextualization, especially yeah. one uh, going towards the Wilmington area that they still like to say the war of northern aggression on their markers like that stuff yeah. Yeah. <laughs> can come down. Right. Um, yeah. But these memorials on these federal lands that have been the Park Service and the Federal Service has been really here. So for me, yeah. if it's not here and getting a sense of space and we can't have it 
somewhere else. But these are one of the better examples, and some of the other ones should learn from these models. Yeah, the, the only other thing I would throw into this, I, I, I think you make really good points, is does it help us in any way understand why so few African Americans visit these battlefields? I mean, doesn't it get us back to the ways in which these memorial landscapes shape who feels welcomed, right? Uh, I'm just sort of, I'm just throwing yeah. that out there. I mean, and, and it gets to one of the questions someone asked about where is, who are the stolen ones? So yeah, the stolen ahead. ones are free African Americans who are kidnapped and then enslaved. Um, and in Franklin County, where I've heard of it on the family porches of yeah. my grandparents, great aunts, church people, everyone, and including the white community too, yeah. um, are the ones who are taken and never come back. That's right. They never, they just disappear. And it's a small farming community. So these losses are real. Yep. And so they always talk about, when they talk about civilian trauma, they talk about the occupations, they talk about Lee and not so favorable terms. And they talk about those enlisted. And then they say, and the stolen ones. Right. And that's all they are is that group. And, of and most people know nothing about this aspect of the camp campaign or the fact, and this is what shocked me the researching for searching for Black Confederates is that. Lee's army, as it's marching north, included at least 10,000 enslaved people. So Lee, first of all, the Army of Northern Virginia is an army of slaves bringing the institution of slavery into the free state of Pennsylvania in July, early July of 1863 that is basically functioning as a slave catching army. Right, uh -huh. and, and, and they talk about a regular slave hunt. Um, I have a yeah. song that I talk about on a muster post, which is a journal of Civil War era, and it's a part of my first chapter of the book, written by Joseph Winters. It's titled 10 Days After Gettysburg. They literally stopped when they started hearing the sounds of war, they started to hide in the um, caverns and different places of the Underground Railroad. And for him, they he didn't feel safe to come out until 10 days out, so he writes this long song. And then writes an enlistment song, but that's yeah. the piece, 10 days after Gettysburg. And he talks about Lee coming in, stealing people. Um, they're called Negro stealers, horse, like they are not polite <laughs> to describe yeah. them. Right. And it's this traumatic event. And so, but most people outside those border counties of the Pennsylvania, Maryland line, and your book does a really good job, and fair few others, um, Ed Ayers talks about them. But yeah. what happens is what happened afterwards for those who survived, and that's been lost. But in those areas, I just know that's one of the things with Brian's farm and what Gettysburg has done recently has brought more African-Americans to that farm. So I know more African-Americans will go to Antietam because of um, Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation right. and Gettysburg, but they will not go to the other ones yeah. because of some kind of tie within the larger African-American yeah. memory. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, we only have a, a few minutes left. I'm just oh, wondering, yeah. just to close this out, I mean, wh what do you think is, I mean, I hate, I hate as a historian trying to predict anything, but I mean, <laughs> you know, is, is, is what we're seeing now going to continue? Um, you know, well, I mean, at at the at the current pace, right? You know, what do you what do you see happening? I mean, Monument Avenue is going to be gone by the end of, apart from the Arthur Ashe statue, by the end of the summer. Charlottesville, perhaps. I mean, is this we're, this is going to continue for the foreseeable? Future. I think it's going to continue, and I think it's going to continue with a couple more years, and it's going to slow back down. And so, for me, because it's just a five years for historians is short. Yeah. And, I'm, and I could barely keep up. And I've been doing a database. And I'm at like 120 removed. <laughs> and most of it's from Charleston on up. And then I have a whole list of like about 25 of the Columbuses and the global ones. Yeah. And then I have a whole bunch now of people who promised that's they're right. removing it. So I'm just like, okay, right. you promised. Yeah. yeah. What does this mean? But that's going to be another 40. That's right. Who else is going to have this? I think these next three years, we're going to see a lot more continuing. And then it's going to slow down. So, but for me, I, my concern is, uh, especially on my campus and other campuses um, who have a slave pass. So, the University of Alabama apologized for slavery. Yeah. We gave a marker in 2006 to it. What happened was we, a culture, like I, I like to call, well, we gave them a marker culture developed. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid that it's going to be, we removed the marker or memorial culture, and then that's all. 
That's all we need to do. Yeah. And for me, removing and adding new is easy. It's easy to add something. It's easy to remove something. But if you don't use that as your starting point to deal with those larger issues, yeah. I don't think it's going to do much in the long run. And so that's been my concern. But I see a lot of the ones at courthouses coming down. And hopefully I can just keep up. And I know I'm going to have to teach this. Yeah. <laughs> and write about this because this is a moment and being a witness to this history. Yeah. And being a witness to my own campus's history, the removal of the boulder, yeah. I could never have expected this. Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't have anything to add to that. I think you just <laughs> summed it up beautifully. I think yeah. with that, we, we could continue this for, I think, for the yeah. next hour or so. But uh, <laughs> I, think, I think we need to hand it back over to Paul right now. So I, I really enjoyed this. Thanks a lot. I think uh, there I am. I was. Let me just say, uh, first of all, I'm glad you brought me back because I have a very important question that's tied into what you all were just talking about. But let me just say, what an amazing conversation! So I have a question for each of you. Which of the monuments that are still remaining that have not been taken down for each of you? are the most offensive and that you really would like to see removed. Dr. Green? I think it's coming down. It's the Calhoun Monument and Monuments uh, in Marion Square, Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, my father's family's from um, James Island, the Low Country. I knew some of the victims of Charleston. I have worshiped in Mother Emanuel. So for me, after all of Charleston, every time I go by it, I'm just, I just, I just want it down, and I think if it comes down, and hopefully there's promises that it, once it comes out, I'll do a dance for joy over <laughs> the removal space like I did for Silent Sam. But that's so the one that needs to come down for me. <laughs> so, so there's a movement out there now to remove that, and and it's come. What do you think in the next well, months? It's the mayor week? announced it yesterday, so I I am waiting. To see it. And if he if it comes out, I'll be a happy person. <laughs> that's great. Um, Kevin, what about you? What's your? Uh... I hesitate to, to to say this because I, you know, we use it in the summer program every year. We bring teachers to Arlington National Cemetery uh, to the Confederate Memorial in the middle of Arlington National Cemetery, and it was dedicated by the UDC in 1914. Surrounds basically the center of roughly 365 Confederate graves, and you know, it's a problematic memorial on a number of levels. It is a non-apologetic. Um, you know, pro-Confederate uh, monument during a time supposedly of national or sectional reconciliation. Uh, but it it reinforces the, in the most direct way, the most explicit way possible, the, the myth of the loyal slave in two ways. It includes the image of the loyal mammy figure. And obviously that's in the news. Yesterday, the company that puts out uh, Aunt Shemima has basically is going to discontinue uh, calling it that, even getting rid of the um, the image itself, uh, that is a classic example of the loyal uh, mammy or the loyal slave image. Um, but this one is of the mammy, the loyal mammy figure, taking the child of the Confederate officer who is about to go off to war. And then in another group on the memorial is a sort of a group of soldiers, Confederate soldiers, and you see what is a, a uniformed black man marching off. And for many people today, they use this where they cite it as evidence of black Confederate soldiers, uh, but it's really a um, a body servant uh, or what I call a camp slave that would have marched off to war uh, with his master. And it's problematic because of course, Arlington is the final resting place for union soldiers, black union soldiers that gave their lives uh, for this country. They're buried off in section 27 in the far corner where very few people actually will ever visit. Uh, the Confederate, section is a very prominent one. And, you know, it it not only sort of pushes that history of black soldiers, union soldiers out of the picture, but it reinforces a, a dangerous view or interpretation of African Americans at a time when, of course, we're talking about legalized segregation. So, uh, so that one is right at the top of my list in terms of um, monuments that deserve at least a very serious discussion. Now, Kevin, now, Kevin is, there, is, there, is, there, is there any movement? No, absolutely not. And there, and I suspect there won't be. No, no. 
Okay. Um, well, I, I, I hesitate. I'm trying to see if I've got, I've got, I think I've got a few more minutes. So I'm going to, I'm going to take liberty here and I'm going to, I'm going to flip that question a little bit and I'll start again with Dr. Green. So of all the monuments that have been removed recently, which one did you do a dance for when that came down? So Silent a monument, Sam. <laughs> Silent Sam. Uh, and again, Tar Heel born, Tar Heel bred. Like, <laughs> and for me as a student, the visceral reaction I had to deal with for five years and still deal with on that campus and the discussions over that, the um, politics of its removal <laughs> and different things and my relationship right. to the university um, has shifted. And But also too, it has pushed me more into entering these debates onward because I had a voice to say. So when it I did get to do it, I did a jump I did a little jump for joy over that. Like <laughs> other people who've been in the fight for Silent Sam, but Silent Sam was the one I did. That's yeah, great. Th this is Kevin. easy. Uh, very easy. Nathan Bedford Forest in Memphis, Tennessee. You know, how how a city can allow uh I mean I know why the statue was placed there originally, but but now of course acknowledging forest role as a slave trader before the war, Confederate general responsible for one of the worst racial massacres during the war. And then of course, uh, after the war, his involvement in the Ku Klux Klan. Um, I didn't do a dance. I don't, you know, I, uh, yeah. but I was, I had a, I had a, a big smile on my face. Uh, <laughs> and of course the next move when it comes to that statue uh, is Forrest and his wife are both buried at the base of the statue. So they still need to be removed as well. So, so the work there is not done. And then, of course, uh, like all of these, um, you know, monuments that are coming down, have come down, or will come down, is the exciting question of what these communities will do to turn these public spaces um, into spaces that reflect the values of the community as a whole and are welcoming uh, to all, um, to, to everyone in those communities. Right. Well, along that those lines, a question came in from our viewers, is are there monuments to black freedom fighters or, or sort of um, um, blacks that are well done and that you think need more recognition or people should see what well, this is, this is an opportunity to put a promotion up for those monuments that people should go see. Um, Dr. Green? I have two. Uh, okay. One is a monument that's in Perquimans County, North Carolina. It's smaller than other ones. It's um, created by African-American women, and it comes up two years before the UDC monument is um, comes up and it's on the edge of the black community. And that is a rare monument of this time that doesn't get a lot of press and dis um, discussion outside of the state. And then the other one is um, in Hampton Park, South Carolina, the Denmark BC um, Garden um, uh, monument one, as well as the um, DC monument over by the Museum uh, for African Civil War African-Americans. Yeah. But I think we need more of them. And one of the questions, Kevin, you asked about what about Lee? I'm like, if we just took Lee down and put um, John Mitchell Jr. on top of it, promote like a black <laughs> critic at the time who's a better represented, I'll be happy there too. But it'll be up to communities to determine right. who are the freedom fighters in their communities that deserve honoring, right. who are the new values, who will replace the ones that have problematic values. And yeah. Right. Yeah, I, I was going to yeah. say the one in D.C. Uh, as well, because it's, um, you know, it is a relatively new monument. It goes back, I think, to the early, I want to say late 90s, I think so. 98. Right. And it's in the Shaw neighborhood, U Street in D.C., uh, close to Howard University. So so the broader landscape in which it's located, a changing landscape, it's, it's becoming more gentrified, uh, which is you know, uh, sort of makes it a bit more complex in terms of how we understand it. But um, but that one to me is uh, is one. If you visit D.C., uh, make it a point to to visit that 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 monument. Absolutely, and the museum across that. the, the museum yeah. that's across the street. Mm -hmm. right. Definitely. Yeah. Well, let me just say thank you to both of you. Um, you know, Dr. Hillary Green and Kevin Levin for joining us for today's cabinet conversations. The, the two of you were terrific. What an informative conversation. What an enlightening conversation. And you've also given everyone, I think, if they didn't have travel, um, 
you know, for the uh, near future, hopefully you've given them some travel plans to go see some of these monuments, to go see the places where these monuments were that were rightfully removed, and also to go see some of these monuments that exist and that really need people to, to promote them. So, so thank you so much. Um, we'll continue to respond to your comments and questions that we didn't get to during the live session. Uh, and please visit our website again, and you can see the, the tape version of this. If you like today's Cabinet Conversations, consider making a gift to Ford's Theater and go to our website at fords.org um, slash donation and join us for the next conversation on July 2nd. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Dr. Green. Thank you, Kevin Levin. We appreciate it so much. Everyone, thank you very much. Enjoy your afternoon.